thank you for joining us today for this webinar on a very handy and free uh, data tool that you can use to evaluate the financial payoff to almost every college in the country. My name is Kim Clark, and I am a deputy, deputy director of the Education Writers Association, and higher education data is one of my favorite topics. Uh, before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, first, a reminder that this is being recorded and everything is on the record, which means you can use any quote or comment you hear today in a story, and um, the chats are also on the record. Everything is on the record. Uh, secondly, uh, in the interest of full transparency, we, we want to be clear that this is a sponsor webinar. And in fact, this is EWA's first sponsor webinar. Uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is an important funder of EWA, also supports the Institute for Higher Education Policy uh, and funded the creation of this tool that we're going to be talking about today, the Equitable Value Explorer. Uh, Gates and I, the Gates Foundation and I have helped uh, develop the speaker list. That said, um, several EWA members have already independently tried out this tool and found it to be very useful to mine data and generate important stories and help support the stories they're working on. Um, they wanted to help other journalists understand how to use it and help you brainstorm some story ideas. So we're gonna get a walkthrough of the tool and then hear about how that data generated stories and then we'll open up for questions from you, the audience. To submit a question for our speakers, uh, please type your question into the question box in the GoToWebinar control plan panel. Uh, please include your name and affiliation when you answer, ask your questions, just so that we'll know who asks. Um, ask your question at any time, and we'll get to them during the Q&A period uh, at the end. Uh, finally, if you're going to tweet about this, please use the hashtag, hashtag EquitableValueExplorer. It's a long hashtag, but that's the one we have. Uh, because we have such a large uh, group of participants, I'm not going to go through all the bios right now, but I will ask each person to introduce themselves um, the first time they speak. So let's start off with Kim Dancy, who uh, led the development efforts alongside much of the IHEP team, as well as a company called Graphicacy, um, which is a data visualization company that helped build the tool. Uh, Kim, can you introduce yourself and give us a tour of the tool? Yeah, thanks so much, Kim. Uh, my name is Kim Dancy, and I am a research associate at the Institute for Higher Education Policy. Um, I want to start today by just saying thank you to EWA for having us here today and to everyone on the call who's joining to learn more about this work, which I'm really excited to share with you all. Um, at IHEP, we really see data as a matter of knowledge and information. Data are vital to taking informed action, particularly as they shine a light on inequities in our post-secondary systems. And that's why we manage the development of the Equitable Value Explorer, which is an interactive web-based tool that puts the measurement framework developed by the Post-Secondary Value Commission into action. The tool is designed to demonstrate the return on investment for students at colleges and universities nationwide. We rely on publicly available data from more than 4,000 higher education institutions across the country, along with supplemental analysis from the University of Texas system to really explore which institutions are helping their students get ahead rather than simply getting by or even falling behind. Before we dive into the tool, there are three key considerations that I want to keep in mind. First is that context matters. So when assessing institutional performance, all numbers need to be viewed within the larger context of an institution and our system of higher education, including an institution's history and mission, state policy and financial support, local and regional labor market conditions, and more. Put another way, any single number is just that, one data point. This is particularly critical in thinking about institutions that prioritize access for historically underrepresented students, including many minority serving institutions and community colleges. These students typically receive less funding from state and local governments, and these disparities are compounded by systemic inequality in K-12 education, intergenerational wealth disparities, differences in housing quality and affordability, healthcare, and labor market labor market discrimination, 
all of which influence students' post-secondary trajectories and labor market outcomes. So while institutions have an important role to play in addressing these injustices, the societal inequities cannot be fully addressed through the post-secondary education sector alone. Number two is that there are some limitations in the publicly available data. So while the Explorer leverages the best available public data from the college scorecard and other sources, those data are incomplete and that's important to keep in mind as well. For example, a lack of earnings outcomes measured separately for students by race, ethnicity, family income, or gender make comparisons across specific demographic groups somewhat difficult. And number three is that outcomes are not causes. These data points are just snapshots of various outcomes institutions are currently seeing, but measuring post-secondary value is incredibly complex. So this data tool and the underlying data are designed to inform institutional improvement efforts, but are not about institutional rankings, penalizing institutions, or making causal claims about value. For higher education to generate economic mobility and disrupt broader societal inequities, institutions need to know their numbers, and policymakers and journalists should know those numbers too. These are vital to implementing data-informed, evidence-based policies that promote equitable value, particularly for students from low-income backgrounds, Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and underrepresented Asian American and Pacific Islander students and women. So with that, I would love to share my screen so that we can dive into the tool. All right. Hold on just a second. All right, here we go. So let's dive in. Um, this is the homepage of the Equitable Value Explorer. Um, and to get to the data tool, you can either click here or at the navigation bar at the top. Um, this section of the tool leverages the best public available data from the College Scorecard and other sources. For your convenience, we've also included the threshold definitions at the top of the page. T0 or threshold zero measures the amount that a student would need to earn to exceed the earnings of the median high school graduate in their state, plus a measure of the cost of their investment in post-secondary education. T1 or threshold one measures whether a student has earnings that meet or exceed the median of others with the same credential in their state. And T2 or threshold two measures earnings parity or whether earnings exceed those of their more advantaged peers. So for example, whether earnings for black students meet or exceed the median white resident with the same credential level. T3 or threshold three measures economic mobility or whether the median earnings of an institution's students are at or above the 60th percentile of income in their state regardless of credential level. We've embedded these threshold definitions throughout the tool for your convenience. On the Explore landing page, you can explore institutional performance across schools on each value threshold based on analyses of College Scorecard and American Community Survey data. There are several drop-down menus on the left-hand side that you can use to change both the vertical and horizontal axes. And you can also use the filters here to restrict the data that's shown to a subset of institutions. From here, you can access institutional profile pages by clicking on this profile button within the scatter plot or by using the search institutions tool, which we'll do right now. This takes us to uh, the institutional profile pages. And again, the threshold definitions are embedded at the top for your convenience. The institutional earnings are at the top of the page and the detailed view shows a single school's 25th percentile median and 75th percentile earnings for all students 10 years after entry alongside each value threshold for that school. So for example, we see here that the median earnings at typical university are about $11,000 higher than the minimum economic return threshold. Scrolling down, we see the disaggregated thresholds for some institutions. 
in cases where a single race, ethnicity, or gender subgroup makes up at least 50% of an institution's enrollment, users will see disaggregated thresholds, which are developed using ACS data on earnings for that group. However, because the college scorecard median earnings data are not currently reported separately by race and gender, these thresholds are not displayed for institutions that serve low percentages of students from a particular group at this time. For colleges that do serve large proportions of students of color or women, the disaggregated thresholds convey the value provided to the students they serve and better account for labor market discrimination that their graduates experience. So for example, typically university is a Hispanic serving institution and a majority of their student body is made up of Hispanic students. So we can see here that the median earnings for the school exceed the overall earnings premium threshold by about $4,000, but exceed the disaggregated threshold by about $11,000. Next, we also included a placeholder for the economic value index and economic value contribution measures. These measures were incorporated by the Post-Secondary Value Commission um, in order to reflect the importance of access and success in promoting value. But unfortunately, these measures cannot be calculated reliably with current college scorecard data. And so they're not shown in this tool with the exception of for UT system institutions, which I will discuss in more detail in just a few minutes. And finally, we included some uh, contextual factors for all of the institutions drawn in, on in the national data set. So each of these factors was found to have a direct role in how an institution performs against the value framework um, and are reported overall and for student subgroups where data is available. The last piece of the national tool is the advanced search option, which shows multiple institutions' performance on the value threshold alongside factors like access, selectivity, and completion rates. On this page, you can use the filters on the left-hand side to look at certain subsets of institutions, much like what we saw on the scatterplot page earlier. And you can also select different types of indicators to focus on for each institution. And this is also where you would download the data um, if that is something that you're interested in. The next portion of the tool is the data provided by the UT system, which you'll click on by clicking on UT system in the navigation bar. The University of Texas system provided robust nuanced data to really demonstrate the full utility of the post-secondary value framework. The more granular UT analyses should serve as a roadmap for institutional leaders hoping to use internal data to supplement publicly available data and inform their understanding of equitable value generated by their schools. From here, users have the option to explore system-wide data or by scrolling down, uh, selecting an individual institution from the UT. The system to explore. The functionality of the UT portion of the Explorer is similar to that of the main data tool, but provides additional detail. So users can use the drop-down menus at the top bar to change the program of study or the institution that they are interested in looking at. And then lower down, there's a separate drop-down menu, which allows users to explore outcomes against different value thresholds, as well as looking at outcomes for completers, non-completers, or both of those groups combined. The first graphic that we see shows median student earnings relative to the economic value thresholds for that institution and field of study by subgroup and over time. Scrolling down the page also reveals the exact percentage of students whose earnings exceed each threshold over time. The default view here shows the percentage exceeding a threshold one year after exit, but users can also toggle to see the percentage passing each threshold after longer periods of time. Adjusting the threshold shown in the bar charts at the top will also change the threshold that's used in these percentage calculations. The UT system data is also robust enough to allow for an exploration of EVI and EVC measures at the institution and program level, which you'll find by scrolling down the institution page. This calculation requires disaggregated median earnings outcomes by race, ethnicity, income, and gender. 
First, the economic value index is a measure of the share of graduates who meet the minimum economic return threshold, or T0, and come from a specific demographic group. Second, the economic value contribution provides a measure of the financial contribution those graduates make to their local economy each year. So for example, at UT El Paso, while a similar share of white students pass threshold zero compared with Latinx students, uh, the school performs very well on access and completion for Latinx students with 86% of completers being Latinx. As a result, UT El Paso has a very high uh, economic value index and economic value contribution for Latinx students. 55% of UT El Paso completers are Latinx and surpass T0 compared with only 34% of completers in the UT system overall. And then we also see that Latinx graduates at UT El Paso contribute 18.6 million to their economy annually. Both of these measures are available at the institution and program level for University of Texas system graduates three years after leaving school. And finally, the UT portion of the tool also includes some of the contextual variables that we saw in the national data portion of the tool. And that concludes the demo portion of our time together today. So thank you again for your time. I'm really looking forward to hearing from our other panelists about how they have used this tool in their reporting and answering any questions that you might have. Um, Kim, uh, I, oh, just to make clear, so what are the dates of the national data, not the Texas data, but what, you know, you said some of the data yeah. goes back 10 years. So what, what is the entry date and what is the earnings date? So we used the data from the 2018-2019 academic year in the college scorecard for almost everything. And for iPads data, it's from the same year. Um, the one exception to that is the earning, the median earnings information are slightly older from 2015-16. So those students would have entered in 2005, and then these are the earnings outcomes for them 10 years later. Um, and so as of right now, the Department of Education has not been updating those data to provide more recent uh, earnings outcomes and has not announced any plans to do so. However, um, I am going to keep my fingers crossed that that might happen and then we would be able to have more recent earnings data. Well, so 2000, so basically it's people who graduated in 2000, June, May of 2016 probably, right? um for the earnings outcomes oh, it no, kind no, of no 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 it's the, it's their earnings in the 2015-16 academic year yeah. i see mm -hmm. but it would have been for people who started college 10 years before that so yeah could that's, have that's that's a little old um what about the texas data is that the same time period or um the texas data is a bit of a broader time period so they were able to provide us with 16 cohorts of data um, and I believe the most recent one was 2017 so that that is both more recent and a little bit older depending on how you look at it but it's a lot more data and so they're able to measure earnings outcomes 15 years after graduation using that data so you're able to sort of see the longer term outcomes as well as the more recent ones for more recent cohorts. Mm -hmm. And um, there have been there's been a lot of talk about student debt and people, you know, especially since the student loan repayments are going to start mm -hmm. next month. This data does not address student loans. Is that correct? It does not. We include um, in our measure of the cost of post-secondary investment. We include interest on student loan payments in that calculation. But we don't explicitly address student borrowing. Um, there is also a measure of the default rate included in some of the contextual variables because that is related to what we're looking at here. Okay. All right. Um, I think it's time to do some practical applications of this tool. So, um, Mirtha, why don't you start us off with how you use the tool and what, what you found useful? Okay, great. So, my name is Mirtha Donestorg. I am HBCU Innovation Reporter at The Plug and we are a news and insights platform examining the black innovation economy. Uh, so since I cover HBCUs, that's more than 100 institutions. 
uh, that span from the U.S. Virgin Islands all the way to Delaware. It's a mix of community colleges, seminaries, law schools, medical schools, so a very diverse, uh, varied group. And with that variety, um, I find that there are very few tools that I can use that have centralized information on all the HBCUs across the country. You know, I can't mm -hmm. necessarily go to a state scorecard and look at all the schools in a certain state because that doesn't cover all HBCUs. So the fact that I could easily find information for all HBCUs is something that I really appreciated in using the Equitable Value Explorer. Um, and I think that can also be helpful for other reporters who are trying to examine information on minority serving institutions like HBCUs. So how I use the tool uh, was in a story examining the economic value of an HBCU degree. I had previously explored economic mobility, uh, how HBCUs are drivers of upward economic mobility, but using this was this tool was a little bit of a follow-up and delving a little bit deeper into um, HBCU economic mobility and economic value. And what I found most useful in the tool was the advanced search option that Kim Dancy uh, just showed, where you could look at different attributes of the schools. So I was able under minority serving institutions to pull all the data that they had on HBCUs and then download it pretty easily. Um, so I could work with it in Excel, which I was a really nice feature to have to try to do some weird copy paste um, where the formatting was all off. Uh, and so then from Excel, I was able to analyze and find schools whose median earnings were um, positive. So the median earnings were above zero for mm -hmm. each of the thresholds. And um, through that, I found that three HBCUs produced graduates whose median earnings were at least as much as those of other college graduates in their state. But like Kim Dancy mentioned, contact context is very important context really matters and so keeping that in mind um, in the piece the, this was you know numbers and it was data but also in, including other pieces of context like labor market discrimination um, and how and the tool is also able to see that uh, more than two-thirds of students on average at hbcus come from or use pell grants and so you know, it shows a little bit about their financial background. Um, I was also able to find which HBCUs produced students whose earnings were on par with the median income of white people in their state, which adds another level of economic value to their degree. Great, great, great. Okay, that's great. Um, Chris, uh, do you want to talk about how you how you were able to use the uh, tool? Sorry, I'm uh, unmuted now. Yes, I would love to, and I've got my screen here. Okay, thank you. So what I was struck by in first using this tool is just the the, the, the grouping of, of universities, particularly on the state level. I would have loved something like this when I was working in, in the local market, just because it's so easy to see kind of how universities compare to one another in your local market, especially if you were thinking about accountability and thinking about which institutions are serving like the the greatest share of, of low-income students or students from different backgrounds. Um, so I, I think it's helpful to kind of look at it in, in that way. And so, you know, I'm going to pick on New Mexico because that's where I am from. And so you can just kind of put that in there as the filter. Uh, sorry, let's see if I can get that to return. Okay. Great, and I found it helpful to look at it on this uh, on the on the visual map, just because it, it helps me to kind of conceptualize where the universities are and and kind of where they compare to one another. Um, <clears throat> but what I wanted to point out is, uh, you know, looking at these. Oh, um, pardon me here. Um, looking at these, you can kind of start to get a sense of, you know, the blue is the publics, the greens are the privates, and then the yellows are the proprietaries, right? And you have that nice median line that can kind of show you where these universities are falling on this scale compared to one another. And so like the big, um, goodness, I'm not exactly sure what's happening there. Um, let me refresh the screen. Okay, um, there we go. So yeah, so this is the university I went to, the University of New Mexico, the main campus, right? It's, uh, 
I think some people in the state would consider it a uh, one of the public flagships or, or a public flagship there. Um, so you get a sense that like, oh yeah, these earnings are pretty significant, but then you start to see like, oh, but there are all these other universities within this landscape that are serving students in a different way, right? So if we look up here, it's Northern New Mexico College is from my hometown in Española, uh, serving more Pell students, right? So it's like, we have to decide like, is it, <clears throat> are we more interested in the schools that are producing like the most earnings? Are we looking at schools that are serving a variety of different uh, constituents, right? And, and so you also kind of see that played out here. Um, I wanted to show you New Mexico Tech here. Oh, um, but I can't quite get it to load the way I wanted to. But there's another university in New Mexico that has exceptionally high earning rates uh, for its students. Oh, let me just go ahead and close this. Oh, and if you can take away my screen for now, I think I'm set. Um, you know, it, it has a high earnings rate, but uh, only 30% of it serves only about a third of students there are Pell students, right? And so it's heavily STEM, heavily male, uh, and you can get all that information just from looking at the screen and, and looking at the value tool and, and kind of how these universities uh, serve uh, populations compared to one another, right? So I, I think from an accountability perspective, especially for, for reporters covering a, a large geographic area, it's so helpful to see that kind of played out um, and, and to see you know, maybe the, the public flagship isn't the one that is serving the most students most effectively. And, and I know that that may not be uh, fun to talk about all the time, but this will allow you to highlight other institutions that may be doing things a little bit differently. Right, so you're saying that in a way it, it can be a solutions kind of journalism tool because it helps you identify um, the schools that might be doing a, a good job that are unsung heroes, sorry. Uh, definitely. And, and you know, I think there's um, often, uh, you know, when you're working, covering a lot of universities across a wide area, it can be hard to keep track of all of them. And, and so in this way, I think it's good to, to uh, just be able to see who they're serving. You know, I, I think that's a big and important part of it as well. I mean, success is great. Um, but I always go a little bit crazy when you see these affordability guidelines the same, like MIT and Princeton are the most affordable universities in, in, the, in the country. And it's like, well, that's if you can get in, right? And, and so you can kind of see that reflected on the local level as well. If you only have, if you're seeing an institution that's doing really well, but it's only taking 20% of Pell students or, or you know, there's a, an admissions rate that seems ex exceptionally high, that should promote more questions for you as a reporter too, you know, not, not just beyond the, our, the, the, the earnings shouldn't be the only thing speaking to you, although it's certainly important. Yeah. Um, great, that's a perfect segue for John because John has covered higher ed for lo these many years and we were talking earlier about how there's an appetite for um, for stories about value, the value of higher ed these days. I mean, certainly that's been a big talking point on the talking heads, right, on TV. So uh, John, can you talk a little bit about just approaching this whole idea of, of uh, Value, value of higher ed stories and the tools and the data that people can use? Yes, thanks, Kim. Uh, I'm John Marcus. I'm the higher education editor at the Heckinger Report. So I've written recently about this return, financial return on investment issue. And I'm here, I think, because I have some practical suggestions based on that experience. But I want to say, having listened to my, my, other, my fellow panelists, I, we, we're, we're sort of drilling down into data and tools. I want to just remind everyone, this is game changing. This is a kind of value for investment that we haven't been able to kind of measure in the past. Um, it's also important to measure things like completion and retention, but um, this is why people go to college. Uh, as much as colleges like to pretend it isn't, um, this is why people go to college. So uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about some additional sources that also use this new outcomes data to determine return on investment, because I think the goal today is to encourage just generally more, more coverage of this topic. Um, all of these guys have detailed, not quite as elaborate as the IHEP tool, um, but spreadsheets with cost and postgraduate earnings of thousands of majors at hundreds of institutions, which you can also use. And sometimes a simple spreadsheet is a simple tool because it's easily sortable. Um, they're simple to use and you can sort the data by state or system or institution, um, uh, how much graduates make by a given major at a given college in dollars 
uh, and maybe initially not necessarily in quartiles or comparisons. Um, and some of the people that have been generating these spreadsheets, uh, I've spoken to in advance of our webinar today and have said that they're happy to help uh, provide the spreadsheets to you directly and to sort them, do some simple sorting for you. The, the first is the Texas Public Policy Foundation, uh, which can show you how much graduates of public universities nationwide are, are earning by major compared to how much they owe in student loans. The second is Third Way, which looks at how long it takes students to recover the cost of their educations, again, by major and institution. They call this the price to earnings premium, and they found that about half of students will recoup their costs within five years very, fairly quickly, but uh, more than half of them never will recover their costs in their, in their, in their earnings careers. Um, they've also used this data, by the way, to put together some great stuff about which college majors actually pay less than what high school graduates are making in your states, uh, which I find, find really, really interesting uh, to see. The third organization that has this data is the Foundation for Research and Equal Opportunity. And this one is also interesting because it looks not only at earnings two years out from graduation, but over a graduate's entire lifetimes by extrapolating from uh, Census Bureau data, uh, which is important because not only is that a rock solid reliable source, the Census Bureau, but because I'm here to tell you that you're going to hear a lot of complaining from the colleges you cover when you write about this topic and when you report about whether they're doing a better job or a worse job or how much their graduates are making or if their uh, ed education was financially worthwhile. They will say it isn't fair to only look at earnings two years after graduation. Okay, but in the next few months, the department will release earnings information for three years out, which is what the gainful employment use rule used. Uh, so it was apparently good enough for that. And again, this third batch of research calculates lifetime income. So that's a good answer to that complaint that you can anticipate from, from colleges. Uh, and by the way, it found that more than a quarter of programs left students financially worse off than if they had never enrolled in college. Uh, as Kim mentioned, that data is hard to kind of sort by race and socioeconomic origins, but it's incredibly important to, to, to start with and then to kind of look at who's being sort of underserved. Um, I don't think any of us will be surprised to find out who it is. Um, so here's what else you're going to immediately hear in response to your reporting on this from your college PR department that never otherwise returns your calls. They're going to complain that we picked the most dramatic examples at both ends of this calculation, the worst returns and the best returns. And you know what? Of course we are. Of course we're going to do that. No one would read these stories if we talked about the programs in the middle. So expect for them to say it's not fair to pick degrees in studio art or philosophy or anthropology. That's incredibly disingenuous because when you look at this research in the whole, it shows that there are thousands of majors at hundreds of public, private, and for-profit institutions that have very poor financial returns, not just a few in studio art. And plus, saying that, well, maybe not all of our programs pay, pay off, but most of them do, is not a very convincing argument. It's like saying some of the cars we make run and some of the cars we make don't run. Um, third way found that there was zero financial return on the investment in nearly 6,000 public, private, nonprofit, and for-profit programs. That's about 16% of the total. And Texas Public Policy Foundation, they only looked at public universities, but they found that graduates in about 1,200 programs weren't earning even half of what they owe in student loans. The colleges will also claim that in some majors, there aren't enough graduates to give you a reliable earnings average. But in fact, that's the, if that's the case, the department doesn't report the income anyway. And finally, and this is pretty minor, I think, the earnings data are only for Title IV recipients, students who get federal financial aid. And okay, that's true, that's a limitation, but that's still 85% of all students that we have data for. Um, so I have one last suggestion, and that is just to be careful with your wording. We're talking here very specifically about a financial return on investment. And so we've been very careful to word it that way. I think we would all agree, since most of us for some reason became journalists, that there are other things that people get out of their college educations than a ton of income. Um, so uh, Kim, I think, is going to post the links to these other sources that I mentioned. One is Andrew Gillen at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, who's told me already that he's happy to share his spreadsheets and do some basis sorting for you. And Foundation for Research and Equal Opportunity 
their data is fully online and you can just load it and look for your institutions. Uh, that's great, 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 great. Um, so um, I was just trying to think of, you know, a news hook because, well, we all need news hooks for our stories. And, you know, just a lot of colleges, they have um, January 1st or January 10th or January 15th deadlines for applications. And uh, John, you were saying that the, one of the issues is that people don't you consumers, students and families don't use this information to decide where to apply to school. And maybe they should be doing that. So can you talk a little bit about how that how we can turn that news hook into a story? Yeah, you know, when you cover higher education, I, I, well, as, as we do all know, um, you do a lot of this, like, uh, mostly it's like, why do colleges do things the way they do it? Sometimes you have to wonder why consumers do things the way they do it. And even at UT, and the reason that we have so much great UT data is because they've been very proactive at, um, at, at doing postgraduate earnings uh, by major. Um, mm -hmm. I talked to the guy in charge of that program, students don't use it. There's, and there's independent data, uh, research that, that's been done um, uh, all around the country about whether, whether consumers actually use this information. Uh, mm -hmm. And they don't. If they did, Kim and I were discussing earlier, if they did, then a lot fewer people would be going to for-profit colleges. Um, they don't look at what their outcomes are, what their financial outcomes are of a program. And I don't understand why. I do think that's gonna change. Partly it's gonna change because this data is available and more accessible now to consumers. Partly because what we've seen and ex was accelerated by the pandemic, this broad public skepticism of the value of higher education, I think maybe that will encourage people to begin to look more closely um, at what they're getting for their money. Uh, Chris and Mirtha, do you see any um, sort of quick turnaround stories in uh, college application season um, that you would want to help people think about? Well, yeah, you know, just echoing uh, John's point here a little bit, you know, in, in the people that I've spoken to, I can't recall anyone who's familiar with the college scorecard or, or you know, who knows how to use it effectively. I, I think what reader, you know, what journalists can do really well here is, is um, you know, it, it's not hard, I don't think, to look at your state, you know, look, look at, a st at the state level and see like, okay, here are the five universities that are doing a particularly good job with earnings, right? And you can explain like, okay, but the cost of tuition here is lower and like, uh, you know, there there's less that the student has to take on initially or, or you know, there's a lot that can be done in, in, in just a short amount of time with this data and, and why it's so useful. Um, and you can also, you know, turn it the other way. I mean, and, and look at like who's, who's not bearing as well. Although as, you know, Kim mentioned earlier, there's uh, institutions on this list that aren't going to um, fare, you know, well on a, like a graduation rate or, or like, you know, we're thinking about community colleges and open access institutions, right? Um, but sorry, to, to recenter, the point is that you can do something quickly and point people, make people aware of this information. And, and even if the colleges are saying like, well, that's not fair or that's not representative or, you know, let people make their own uh, decisions, right? Like let bring this to the, the table and, and, and kind of give people another avenue to explore what college maybe means to them and, and what they want to get out of it. And Mirtha, you know, there's a lot of good news stories in this hidden in this data about MSIs. Do, do you want to talk about how people can use it to highlight the schools that should, should be getting more attention? Yeah, um, I, I think the specificity that you can get in this tool. So when people talk about MSIs, they usually just kind of lump it all together. You know, Hispanic serving institutions are the same as tribal colleges, are the same as HBCUs. At least that's how the federal government wants to fund them. But uh, they are really different. And in being able to look at each individual school and easily, because you can get, you know, big data sets from iPads and you can find HBCU, but <laughs> I'm learning, having to learn an entire coding language just to easily sort through all of that data. And so with it being easily like downloadable in an Excel spreadsheet, I think that one lends to being able to do a bit more of a quick turn um, piece, but also being able to compare the different MSIs and then within each group, compare different schools based off of tuition, based off of acceptance rate, Pell right. Grant, um, you know different the the racial um ethnic breakdowns because they might be a hispanic serving institution but that can vary it can be a, a wide range in how right. uh, what percentage of their um their school student body 
is Hispanic or with HBCUs, there's there's a, a, it varies in terms of Pell Grant and um, Black student population and all of that. So I think being able to drill down and not just think of all of these schools as a monolith is a, is a right. real boon to reporters. Great, 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 great. Okay, um, Kim Dancy, we have um, a question. Can you go back a little more slowly over the thresholds? Explain um, what the threshold one is. Just can you go back over that a little bit? Yeah, of course. The, uh, the thresholds definitely bear repeating, which is why they're in the tool a number of different times, just to have for reference. Um, so the threshold zero, which we often refer to as T0 is our minimum economic return threshold. And that is based on the median earnings of high school graduates in your state. And then we've also included the costs of post-secondary education in threshold zero. So that's a, a baseline economic return measure. Um, and then threshold one or T1 is a measure of an earnings premium. So you're looking at the median earnings within your credential level. So if you get a bachelor's degree, what are other bachelor's degree recipients in your state getting um, and how does your school compare to other schools with the same uh, programs and credentials? And then uh, T2, threshold two is earnings parity. Um, and so this is a measure of equity within groups and across groups. Um, and so it is really specific to the subgroup in question. So it's a comparison of the average earnings of specific groups compared to their more advantaged peers. So we use white students as the reference category for students of color and then men for comparisons to earnings for women. Um, and then finally, we have T3 or threshold three, which is our economic mobility threshold, um, which just measures if the earnings of graduates are sufficiently high enough to get them into the fourth or fifth income quintile. So it's the 60th percentile of earnings in the state or higher. Um, okay, um, and just to make sure, so your original source of data does have earnings by race and gender, right? Yeah, so this is American, not an imputation. No, the American Communities Survey has the earnings outcomes that are used to generate the thresholds, and those are available uh, at pretty granular levels for students from different race ethnicity. But the score, the score, the scorecard has data by um, race and gender also, right? So you're comparing. Mm -hmm. The right. median earnings available through the scorecard are not available by race and gender, so we're comparing in most cases, overall earnings from the scorecard to earnings thresholds from ACS that can be measured separately. Um, and so that's why we don't have the disaggregated thresholds for schools that have less than 50% of their enrollment from a given group, because we just didn't feel like it would be a fair comparison. So if, if a school is, um... 60% Hispanic, then you do have the data and you, yeah. you assume that all the 100% of the earnings is uh, that the 60% 100 that it's that the Hispanic population earns the same as the average at that school, right? Yeah, and there might still be differences there, but we felt like it would be a smaller gap than we didn't want to have that comparison for institutions that are predominantly white institutions or are just not serving serving very small portions of students from a particular group and, and one of the you know biggest stories we write about i think is is socioeconomic mobility and education's relationship to that is there any way to use this data to tell which schools are taking let's say pell grant students and moving them into as you mentioned the fourth or fifth um income quintile 10 years later can you look break out the, the lower income student impact yeah so we don't have earnings data in the scorecard that is i th i think jen and amanda do you know the answer to this question i feel like i'm getting yeah. jump i'm happy to to take a yeah. um take a go at it you know so you know because of the limitations of the scorecard and one of the 
values of this tool is one, using the data we have to be able to have the value conversation with colleges and universities now, even with these limitations, there are still stories to be told, there are still questions to be asked. That said, because the uh, earnings data are not disaggregated, what's most useful in the tool, if you recall from the, the bubble chart that Kim showed, you can look at bands of institutions by diversity. And so looking at, for instance, if you wanted to find institutions where you could reasonably assume that they're doing well on behalf of their low-income students, you would look at institutions that have 50, 60, 70% or upwards of Pell students, and you can look within that band to identify which schools that are serving similar proportions of low-income students are doing better or worse with respect to their earnings outcomes. So can't get the precise uh, you know, Pell earnings data uh, for Pell students, but it does give us some directional data on how schools that are serving more diverse populations are doing. The UT data does break that down, and that's really the benefit of the UT data is to be able to see those differences by race, by income, by gender. But really, I think this is an opportunity for the field to push for greater information. You know, it could be calculated with currently uh, available to the Department of Education. They could calculate medians for students by income. They could calculate medians for students by gender. They don't currently publish that information. They'll be able to add race uh, to their data set as that gets added to the FAFSA. And so, you know, I think this community and other communities pushing for the release of these data that are in the underlying data sets but not yet publicly available is part of what the role of this tool is as well, is, to, is that data movement and the movement for better data. We, we have a question from uh, Rebecca Koenig of EdSurge about um, how much of the, of the earnings differential is fair to attribute to the college versus the location or the hiring, you know, I mean, how much, uh, or the hiring, you know, hiring situation, I mean, company pay inequities, how, how much can we really attribute to the colleges themselves? So I can start just by flagging that we did um, adjust the earnings by different states. So there is some reflection of differences in cost of living based in those earnings. Mm -hmm. um, the broader question, I think, is pretty complicated because the impact of systemic racism and gender discrimination is just really hard to wrap your head around. Um, so we wanted to create a tool that both acknowledges those inequities uh, within the workforce and beyond, but also recognizes that what colleges and universities do matters. Um, and so we have created all of these disaggregated thresholds and the economic value index and the economic value contribution as different ways to try and sort of assess some of those questions. But it's a it's a really nuanced question, I would say. Um, let's see, Jill Barche of the um, Heckinger Report um, asks, can this data be used or should this data be used to basically calculate an ROI, a return on investment, and look at how much money people are investing in that school versus what they're getting out in terms of paychecks? Yeah, I think that our threshold zero measure is probably the closest to measuring an ROI, um, if you look at the median earnings of institutions relative to that threshold, you do get a sense of, on average, are students earning more or less than they've invested, plus the, you know, the measure of earnings of high school graduates you can think of as sort of their opportunity cost or what they would be earning in absence of the program. So. Um, I don't know if it exactly mirrors ROI. There is a lot of technicalities you can get into there, but I would say that that's the measure that is the closest to getting at that framework. And when you talk about ROI, are you when you look at the input, the, the cost, are you looking at net cost or how are you determining cost? 
Yeah, we're looking at the total cost of attendance over the course of the degree program. So that varies if it's a four-year program, if students take five years to complete, that's also included in there. And then we've subtracted out grant aid and other gift aid that does not have to be repaid um, and accounted for some of the costs of borrowing that are also associated with higher education. So it does include living costs and it's a pretty um, expansive definition of the investment that students are making. So um, we all know that <laughs> for most students, it takes more than four years to finish a four-year program, right? So are you, when, are you actually looking at how long it actually takes people to finish or are you just, for a four-year program, it's, it's four years? Yeah, we have uh, estimates of how long it actually takes. So there's okay. information in iPads about the number of completers within four or five or six years. Right. For two-year programs, there's the same information for two, three, or four years. And so we use that to estimate how long it takes the average student to get through the degree program and have incorporated that into our cost calculation as well. Okay, great. Uh, Amanda, you've been pretty quiet. Do you mind if I bring you in to the conversation? You know, um, a lot of us, you know, we really enjoy playing with data, and this is a really cool, interesting looking tool, but how do we turn this or how do you want to turn this into action? What actions do you want to come out of this this new tool? Yeah, I think that's that's a great uh, great question and builds on a lot of the work that we did um, with the Value Commission overall and some of the resources we released earlier this year, which included an action agenda. Um, because each institution, states, and federal government play a a unique role um, and they can leverage this information um, to spur action on um, uh, spur action that results in student success so whether that's equalizing access to increase post-secondary value on campuses um, re uh, removing affordability um, as an impediment to post-secondary value um, they can look at completion gaps and work to eliminate those um, and strengthen post-college outcomes um, they can improve data i think um, building on uh, a lot of Jen's great remarks. She was standing on a similar data soapbox that I'm usually on, um, but I think that's one area where um, we we have a lot of gaps um, in the publicly available data, and there is a lot that the department could currently do. Um, we released a letter in, Ju in July of this year from the Post-Secondary Data Collaborative that outlined some recommendations for improvements to the college scorecard to leverage what we've got, but we could also work with Congress to pass something like the College Transparency Act, which would close many of the, the comprehensive data gaps that we have at the infrastructure level and result in, in better data. Um, and we can also promote social justice pro by providing equitable post-secondary value. And, and each institution, states, and the federal government has a different role that they can play um, in different in advancing different level, levers and policies that will result in equitable value. Um, and so I'm I'm really excited that um, folks have the chance to dive into this data and that institutions can use the methodology that we've put out and essentially mirror what the University of Texas system did um, and do that kind of analysis on their campus, that more granular analysis, and, and do more of a deep exploration. You know, um, we're all kind of waiting to see how COVID <laughs> peters out, if it will. Um, and um, I think a lot of us are, would be concerned that data from 2015-16 is, you know, no, that's a totally different world ago. So, um, when, Kim and Jen and Amanda, when will we have data that starts to reflect the new reality, the post-COVID employment and earnings reality? Do, or how can reporters start to look at that? Any, any thoughts? Um, so that's going to vary a bit by data source, and I, I welcome Kim and Jen to jump in as well. Um, I think uh, 
Kim and I think Jen both noted that at the national level that the college scorecard is not updating their institution level data um, at this point in time. And so in the absence of that, we do have program level earnings that are released, but those are at a, a much shorter time horizon. Um, states um, are a great source of this information. Um, they collect data from their unemployment insurance wage records, usually at the, the labor market information offices. Um, and um, institutions, sometimes state longitudinal data systems will do this. Sometimes um, institutions and systems have relationships with those state offices to be able to do this, this kind of data matching and they'll put them out on state scorecards and report cards. Unfortunately, that's uh, sort of disparate sources. Um, so you have to go sort of individually. Um, so with the lack of more comprehensive data, we don't have a centralized place for it. Um, but there is going to be, I think, a bit of a data lag across the board. Um, and am looking at I can't give you a precise date on when to expect the information, but usually it takes a couple years um, for uh, for systems to link that kind of administrative data. Yeah, so so I know some states, Colorado, Virginia, Texas, um, do have make public a lot of uh, good data, but and Florida, I think, also in Texas, um, but not every state does. Um, Jen, is there any other advice on if people want to cover the impact of COVID, um, the link between education and and, uh, and earnings, you know, post COVID? Any thoughts about where they can turn soon rather than three years from now? Uh, I mean, I do think that Amanda, so uh, I forgot to introduce myself last time, Jen Engel, I'm the director of the data strategy in the US program here at the Gates Foundation. Uh, you know, I do think Amanda gave some good places to start, especially looking at states uh, that are publishing these kinds of data. States actually predated uh, the college scorecard in terms of being out in front. But again, that's probably about a dozen states that are making this information publicly available. It's not, wi it's not widespread. And most times it's confined to the public universities uh, and colleges. And so, you know, the scorecard still remains our best opportunity to look at the range of institutions that schools are going to. I do think that the new program data, uh, you know, they are nearing being able to show three years out, uh, you know, students can face consequences with regards to repaying their student loans pretty quickly. And so, even though it doesn't give you the long range forecast on students' uh, performance, looking at those program data, uh, even one, two, and three years out, as John said, can be indicative of the extent to which students are going to have difficulty. Uh, and if you even look in the UT data, the gaps that we see by race, by gender, by income start in year one and they get worse over time. So I think you can extrapolate from that uh, that more recent program data from the college scorecard to start to tell those stories. Yeah, and just in case any of our audience are not familiar with it, this college scorecard is a, just Google it, you can find it. Um, it's a Department of Education website with a huge, huge data set that you can actually download. Um, and unfortunately, as Kim Dancy mentioned, they used to publish data for every school every college they're sort of the average earnings for every college and i think in 2017 or so they switched from every college to every major within every college right or, or they're calling it program but it's really like a major um and so they're not doing the overall averages for the school um so it's really hard to so so the data is in some ways better because it's by major but it, um, for example, doesn't include data on people who dropped out and therefore, um, you know, didn't finish with a major. So all the, you know, we all know 40% of students don't actually start college but don't finish. So they're missing a whole 40% of the college starters. You know, that's kind of a, a big problem. So there is a lot of data out there, but it's not exactly touching on what, what we all would like to know, I think. Oh, we've hit three o'clock. So, um, I just wanted to see, uh, John, Chris, or Mirtha, do you have any last advice for reporters? Um, one quick thing. I, I think just picking up on the last few minutes of conversation, the reasons that there's gaps in the data is because higher education has lobbied very hard for there to be gaps in the data. Yeah. Um, whether we call this a return on investment or not, 
the fact is it, it, it's important for consumers to know how much college will cost them and how much they'll earn as a result. And we should be doing that. Um, these same colleges <laughs> that don't want to make this data widely available and, and be transparent are the same ones that brag about postgraduate placement rates that they essentially make up um, and lie about postgraduate earnings in many cases when they don't, it, you know, with the exception of places like UT. UT. We should hold them accountable for this and on, on, on behalf of our readers who are consumers of this product. Chris, any, any last thoughts? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, you know, along those lines, I mean, if, if you're encountering institutions that, saying, that are saying that this isn't a fair way to think about it or, or you know, that this isn't representative of, of their population, I mean, universities are tracking this to some extent, right? And, and so you can ask them, well, what is a fair representation of this? Or what is the correct way to think about this? And, you know, this this could essentially be just a way into that conversation that, that you know, if, if this is, if you don't like this, then like, what is the most representative? Representative thing to, to actually look at, right? And so I, I think, um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about kind of the limitations here, but this is a good like way to, to get yourself into this conversation around return on investment and around whether or not these degrees are going to pay off long term in a way that, you know, maybe um, that, that we haven't been able to talk about before. So that's my last great. thought there. That's great. Miritha, I'll give you the last uh, chance to wrap up. Any, any, that's a great that's a great way to start a conversation, Chris. Mirtha? Yeah, and I would say that it's a great way to start a conversation and then to build out an entire, you know, more information around it. So like with HBCUs, now that I know from this tool, what are the schools that are providing value that are at least as much as white folks in, um, you know, in their respective states, then from there, that starts a whole new thread and a whole new information. And I think it's a way to start a conversation, but also starting a jumping off point for deeper, more reporting. Yeah, great. OK, this has been great. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank our guests, uh, especially Kim, Mirtha, John, and Chris, and of course, Jen and Amanda. And in addition, I would like to uh, thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for funding this webinar. And I want to thank you, today's attendees and EWA members. As soon as the webinar closes, you'll see an evaluation survey. Please complete it because your feedback really does help us improve. And finally, just a reminder that the end of the year and the holidays are a great time to go over your clips from last year and submit your best work to the EWA awards. You can submit on, all on your own. You do not need anything from your editor. Um, you get it. Winners get a career boosting uh, industry recognition plus cash. Cash awards are raising from, ranging from $1,000 to $10,000. So please remember to uh, do yourself a favor and enter into the awards program. So thanks to everybody, and uh, we'll see you at our next event. <laughs>